So, is that new sidewalk? Thanks for coming out uh, brutally early in the morning, and I hope everyone's having their coffee. I have it, but that's okay. So, <clears throat> I'm excited to <clears throat> be introducing the second of our integrative biology postdoc fellow uh, interviewees, and uh, <clears throat> Jake. And I actually was we need to ask you to um, pronounce your last name to make sure I do it right. Algier. 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 <laughs> I was trying to Frenchify it, I guess. Yeah. Where, where I'm from, it's actually Algar, but that's a like <laughs> soft farmers and whatnot. So. Algar, Algar. 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 Um, so Jake uh, got his bachelor's in 2001 from Center College, and then went on to do a PhD at the University of Georgia, um, where he's worked on this really nice intersection of uh, of basically individual and population-based functional uh, trait-based ecology, scaling up to communities and ecosystems, but doing it experimentally, which is what's especially impressive. And so uh, his work has uh, led to both uh, an impressive number of publications for somebody who's defending the spring, is that right? Yeah, they were both there. <laughs> uh, so defending the spring, he has 11 publications, five of which are first author, and those include ecology, ecology letters, aquatic ecology, very experimental progress series, a, uh, really a journal of applied ecology, so published in really good places, uh, as well as some good funding. He had an EPA STAR fellowship, he had an NSF uh, DDIG, and uh, then he uh, wrote or co-wrote with Craig Lehman and some others an uh, NSF grant that got funded uh, to the tune of six hundred and fifty-seven thousand um, dollars, so he's uh, apparently capable of, of getting money to do the work as well, which is great. Um, and oh, I guess I'll leave it at that because uh, I think, in some sense, the punchline is the fact that he's doing experimental reef ecology, uh, which is just remarkable. So I'll just let him tell you about that. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So I first want to say that it's a, it's a real honor to be invited here. Um, this is an amazing apartment, and it would be, it would be fantastic to be able to work with some of the faculty here in the future. And hopefully I can bring some, some interesting ideas to the table uh, in this department. So today I'll be talking with you all about the research that I was, I've been working on for the last seven years or so. And the idea basically is to try to think about how consumers are affecting food webs from some of these alternative patterns. And namely, that's through pathways of nutrient cycling and storage. I first started thinking about animals and moving nutrients in ecosystems when I was an undergrad, and I worked on sockeye salmon in Alaska. So this is a picture of sockeye salmon running up a headwater stream in Alaska. And when I was up there, one of the researchers showed me a tree core, and they pointed out one of the rings that was particularly fat. And they said, this ring indicates a year where salmon were, the salmon nodes were really high. And so this really struck me, the idea that salmon are moving nutrients all the way from the marine environment up into these headwater streams and lakes. And it's, there's so much nutrients that it could actually affect the production of tree growth in the terrestrial ecosystem. It really blew me away. And again, I was an undergrad, so these ideas are brand new to me. I then went on to work with Alex Flecker, Brad Taylor, and Bob Hall on this really awesome project where we split a stream and a half of this curtain to remove a uh, dominant consumer uh, fish species. And this fish has been heavily overfished throughout this region of Venezuela. And so we're trying to understand how the loss of this fish would affect biogeochemical processing within the stream. And you can see here in this photo, it fundamentally did. It totally changed the way carbon and nutrients flowed in this ecosystem. So while we were doing that research, one of uh, Alex's students, Pete McIntyre, was actually measuring the excretion rates of every single species in that stream. And what he went later on showed was that where fish aggregate in high density, so high biomass, they recycled a ton of nutrients, and those nutrients fed back on primary production, and this, this initiated biogeochemical hotspots within the ecosystem. And so this further highlighted the fact that if we're losing these consumer species in the ecosystem, it's going to fundamentally affect how the whole ecosystem is. So the next sort of progression was to work in the Bahamas. Craig Lehman, who um, I guess now is going to NC State, 
Um, he, I met him as a PhD student. He was a PhD student and work, was working on a project with Alex Fucker in Venezuela. And he asked me to come to the Bahamas and work with him there. And, um, to be honest, I wasn't super excited about the Bahamas because I was really into the you know, tropics. And, uh, but he offered a free plane ticket, so I couldn't really turn it down. So um, I went here to work with this, this system with him, and there's two things that really struck me. First of all, you could see. So I was used to working in rivers where when you dive under, you can see your hand about that far away. But here, it was super clear. And so you could, first of all, you could just watch the animals moving around the ecosystem. And that, to me, was really interesting because that's just the way things were. But second of all, it suggested that the nutrients in this ecosystem were really limiting because if there was lots of nutrients, the water would be more green because algae would be using these nutrient materials. And so this alone set a good stage for consumers potentially having an important role in recycling nutrients. The second thing I noticed was that the, the fish biomass and abundances were extremely high. The place where I was, where I went with Craig Dan and still continue to work is a real, relatively healthy coastal ecosystem. So the fish communities are doing pretty well. And so this also suggests that consumers could be important in the role of recycling nutrients because there's so much of them. The biomass is extremely high. Um, so this really set up a kind of nice scenario for this being a potentially model ecosystem to test some questions about the role of consumers in recycling uh, and storing nutrients. In addition, these ecosystems are also heavily impacted. So this is a a really nice map of the global ocean showing where in the world humans are having the largest impacts. And I want to point out first that in red, humans are having the most impacts along coastal, uh, coastal ecosystems, which makes sense because that's where humans are interacting most with oceans. But I also want to point out one of the areas they highlight as being most impacted is the Caribbean. This is actually focused in the southern parts of the Caribbean. And so this also uh, sort of encouraged me as to work in this system, we could also we could be, we could be testing some basic questions about um, some some basic ecological questions, but also within a provide context that could ultimately have some conservation implications. So the two stressors that are two of the dominant stressors and two of the stressors that I mainly focus on are for fishing and eutrophication. And so um, from 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 here, I've, or since I've been working with Amy Roseman at the Odom School of Ecology at UGA. Amy is a, a freshwater aquatic, ecos uh, aquatic e ecosystem ecologist. And so it's been a really awesome opportunity for me to, to work with freshwater ecologists and take some of the tools that they're using and apply it to a system that, is, that, that hasn't really been exposed to some of these, these tools. And, and we found a lot of really interesting things. So the goal is I'm basically linking food web, uh, community, and ecosystem ecology together to ask some of these questions. So when people think about food webs, they often think about food webs from a top-down perspective or a consumptive perspective, where consumers are regulating different trophic levels um, and regulating their abundances. There's additionally some of these indirect effects like trophic cascades where you have uh, top predators uh, affecting the herbivore populations and that in turn affects the abundances or communities of the primary producers. So I'm in, in addition to these things, I'm, in, I'm interested in some of these alternative pathways whereby consumers are actually fundamentally um, affecting the rate and ratios at which nutrients are cycled in these ecosystems. And that can have important implications for the primary producers. So in essence, they're fertilizing the environment with their excretion. And in this context, I'm typically focused on nitrogen and phosphorus because these are the two predominant macro nutrients that are limiting primary producers. And we typically think of them as ratios. And so this is just a kind of a heuristic model. I don't want to get busted on the stoichiometry of daphnia. But, um, but if you think about it in this sense, if a daphnia has a large amount of, of nitrogen and a small amount of phosphorus, that means it needs a lot of nitrogen to, to simply um, to, for maintenance and uh, growth, et cetera, and not as much phosphorus. And it's, if it's feeding on a resource that's high in phosphorus, it's going to be recycling nutrients back to the environment that are high in phosphorus relative to nitrogen because it's holding on to all the nitrogen from its food resource. Thinking about fish, fish typically have more phosphorus in their body because they have bones. And if they're feeding on a resource that's low in phosphorus and high in nitrogen, they're going to be recycling nutrients that are low in phosphorus back to the environment because they're retaining all the phosphorus in their body. And so in conjunction, this, this is what makes this whole this whole interaction interesting because we have a complex or we have a community of different organisms that are recycling at different rates and ratios. 
And so I'm trying to extend this framework into a more complicated uh, ecosystem. Most of my work uh, occurs from the coral reef through seagrass and into the mangrove, uh, to the mangrove beds. So it's basically like the, the back reef complex. And then I mostly work with fish communities, but also with the vertebrate communities. And from a stoichiometric uh, viewpoint, we can think about each species as really having a unique ratio. And so in that sense, they could uniquely be affecting nutrient storage. And then when you consider what they're feeding on, they could be affecting the, the recycling of nutrients in this environment. And in particular, when you think about species together in a community, this can really, this can really determine how these, these rates and ratios of nutrients are being fed to the environment. In the context of human stressors, so here thinking about overfishing, where you remove the top predators, you remove the top predators, and, and fundamentally change the community composition. This can really affect how these communities are storing, recycling nutrients to the environment. So that that leads me to the basic hypothesis that I was working with. Essentially, it's that consumers regulate nutrient dynamics in coastal ecosystems. To test this. I first needed to ask, do nutrients limit primary production? So if they don't, then this question is not really important because the role of consumers in recycling nutrients isn't necessarily going to matter. The second question is, if um, can consumers can, can consumer nutrient supply enhance primary production? And so to specifically ask these two questions, I used an experimental approach, and this research was conducted uh, in the Bahamas. Third, if it is the case that consumer nutrient supply can affect primary production, can we scale these things up to the ecosystem level? Can we look at this on a broader context? And to ask this question, I use more of a quantitative approach. And then finally, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to also um, discuss some of the proposed research for this fellowship. And this research sort of uh, extends some of the work that I've been doing, but also tries to incorporate other sub-disciplines within uh, ecology. Alright, so do nutrients limit primary production? To test this, I uh, use what are called nutrient diffusing substrates. These are widely used in freshwater ecosystems, and I think this might be the first in marine environments, but basically they're little film canisters. They're filled with an auger that's amended with a certain nutrient. And in this case, I amended it with nitrogen alone, phosphorus alone, and then both nitrogen and phosphorus. And the idea is we're testing nutrient limitation of benthic micro. So these are not dominant in terms of biomass, but they are very much so in terms of production, so turnover. And um, the treatment that elicits the largest response, so is the is that is like growth of algae on it, is the one that's suggesting which nutrient is most limiting. So if we had the most growth on this nitrogen treatment, that means that nitrogen is most limiting this benthic microalgae. So I tested this across a suite of different sites in this back reef area. And then here on the y-axis we have uh, the chlorophyll A, which is a proxy for biomass. And the four treatments are the different colors. And what I want to point out is really the one you need to focus is the black bar, which is the nitrogen and phosphorus treatment. And so this is saying that nitrogen and phosphorus together, so there's dual nutrient limitations occurring, are limiting benthic microalgae. And, you, and even in some cases, uh, the single nutrient treatment had essentially no effect relative to the control. So to highlight that, this is actually just a photo of one of the bars after it had been uh, incubated. You can see essentially no growth on the three treatments and then a lot on the, on the dual nutrient treatment. And so this really does suggest that, that benthic microalgae are extremely nutrient limited. And so it provides good context for consumer nutrient cycling. I also um, compared these experiments with other experiments, um, other similar experiments in different ecosystems, marine ecosystems around the world, and found that the Bahamas are among the most nutrient limited within this type of experimental uh, bioassay. So another way to test nutrient limitation is actually to measure the percent nutrients that are stored in seagrass. So you can look, you can kind of look across an environmental gradient and where you have more nutrients you'll see more nutrients being stored in the tissue of seagrass. And so this is uh, Thalassia tested in them, which I've tested this with. And so I measured, um, I tested this in seagrass beds in, uh, in the Bahamas and compared it to these global uh, minimum and averages that were um, compiled by Duarte in the, in the early 90s. 
And with respect to their percent nitrogen, you can see that they're lower than the values in the Bahamas are lower than the, the global average and roughly similar to the global minimum. But phosphorus, it's substantially lower than even the global minimum. So this just reinforces the idea that nutrients really are limiting primary production in these systems and that the role of consumers in recycling nutrients could be really important. Okay, so now we have some evidence that nutrients do limit primary production. Can the supply of nutrients by consumers actually enhance primary production? So we realized to test this, we needed to colonize the fish. And uh, artificial reefs have been widely used in marine ecosystems to test basic questions about community and population ecology, but not so much for ecosystem ecology. So our basic hypothesis was we could build these reefs, this would colonize fish. Colonizing the fish would enhance the amount of nutrients being recycled around the reefs, and this could affect primary production, so the growth of, growth of this production. That in turn could potentially affect um, secondary production, which could possibly feed back to the fish community. And so in this way, we could potentially be creating a biogeochemical hotspot similar to those that Pete McIntyre found in those streams in Venezuela. So to test this, we, um, we had two basic questions. First, does nutrient loading by fishes enhance seagrass prime production? And second, can artificial reefs actually function as biogeochemical hotspots? So this is a really fun project to do. Um, this project, as well as uh, really all the field stuff, was done uh, with Craig Langman. And um, it was awesome because he was the one that had to haul the center box out of the water. And then me and one of his students were underwater the whole time building these reefs. And so there were three treatments. One, uh, one treatment, which there were 10 reefs of, were 40 center blocks. And so this is our large reef. Uh, this is literally the day of construction. There were five reefs that had 10 center blocks, so a smaller unit, and then five quote unquote reefs that were really in control. So this created a gradient of fish density that we could test these questions on. And these are in about 10 feet of water. And I know I said the water is clear. This was a murky day. So, um, these are about 10 feet of water in seagrass beds. And so we, we wanted to let these things incubate for a couple years. And Craig had some students doing some community ecology on these reefs as well. But I won't talk about it today. But um, so while these things were out, out there doing their doing their business incubating, I spent the next few years measuring empirically excretion rates of, of fish. So literally I would go out with hook and line, traps, um, nets, whatever I could do to get these things live, and you just place them in a bag and you measure the nutrient in the water before and after the fish has been in the bag. And so I did this for 76 different species and over 650 individuals. And um, I was interested in measuring both excretion and storage of nutrients, so because I think something that that um, is also really important in these systems is considering the fact that fish are dominating biomass as well, so they're actually retaining a lot of the, the nutrients in these ecosystems. But to measure the storage, I had to unfortunately kill every fish, take it back to the lab, grind it in a blender, and then measure the nutrient content in, the, in their body. So this literally meant four and a half foot more eels, and then sometimes just little tiny fish as well. But um, and so. This might sound like a strange method to put a fish in a bag, because obviously it's not the natural environment, um, but it is actually the standard method for doing this. But I wanted to, to, to make sure we were getting really good estimates. So I also constructed bioenergetics models, which are another way to estimate excretion rates. And I informed the empirical measurements with these bioenergetics models in a Bayesian framework to create what I think are really robust estimates of excretion rates. Okay, so this picture I just put up here to show you that if you build it, they will come. Fish love structure and all you got to do is put it out there. And so we saw fish at times by the thousands on some of these reefs. And so it was really awesome and this gradient really did work. So we were able to manip manipulate the densities of fish on these things. And so some results. On the y-axis we have seagrass growth rate um, per area per day. And on the x we have nitrogen supply and phosphorus supply. And so I calculated these by modeling the uh, excretion rate estimates onto um, biomass values that we got through doing repeated surveys. So over the course of a couple of years, we would go out readily and, or regularly and do surveys uh, to estimate the fish communities. And what you can see is just a, a, a really strong positive relationship. So basically, where you have more fish excretion, you have more growth by seagrass. It's exactly what we hypothesized. 
So can these reefs create biogeochemical hotspots? To test this, we measured the nutrient content in the seagrass. So percent phosphorus here and percent nitrogen here. And as I said earlier, if you have higher nutrients in the environment, the seagrass will show that or reflect that in, the, in their tissue. And on the uh, x-axis, we have distance from reef. So, and there's, there's four uh, colors here, but for the purpose of this talk, this 40 high and 40 low is really just the, the artificial reefs with the 40 center blocks, so the larger reefs. And what you can see as you move away from the reef, you get this nice negative nonlinear function. And so that's saying that at a certain point, the, the, the excretion of nutrients by fish isn't actually affecting the, the seagrass at all. So there's actually a threshold that we can calculate where the biogeochemical hotspot essentially ends. And then for nitrogen, you saw the same thing, but in this case, there were so many fish on these reefs that the, um, that the threshold was beyond where we actually met it. So we estimated it's probably around 13 or 14 meters. And so this is something we expect to continue to, be, to extend over years and something we'll keep testing. Okay, so the implications of uh, what we found for seagrass beds are first, we think that this these, these artificial reefs can actually enhance fisheries production. There's a, there's a general argument in the artificial reef literature whether they can actually enhance production or if they're just actually colonizing fish from around uh, the area. And so but we're, we're arguing that fish are uh, interjecting this material good, nutrients, into the ecosystem that's, that's creating more production, so that's actually adding more carbon into the food web that can cascade up or they can uh, move up the food web and potentially ultimately enhance production. And this is something that, that I'm, I'm um, going to be modeling in the future. So I'm really excited about this idea. We also do have some numbers on invertebrates on these reefs as well that I will be talking about. But second, these reefs could be affecting carbon sequestration in these environments. So there's this concept of blue carbon. And that's really just the carbon that's sequestered by the, the global oceans. And coastal seagrass beds occupy less than 0.2% of the global oceans, but sequester up to 10% of the carbon stored in them per year. And so there's a lot of carbon being stored in these ecosystems. And so we think that by increasing the seagrass growth rate, we're enhancing the carbon sequestration uh, locally and potentially extending that beyond the reefs. And so where most of this occurs is in the rhizomes and the roots. And so that's something we're also measuring right now. We're taking cores trying to estimate how much root production is increasing over time. And so this has really strong implication for overfishing. So not only could it potentially re reduce carbon sequestration, but it could also be uh, decreasing potential other fisheries productions. So a question that I, um, I often get from, from scientists, but also fishermen down in the Bahamas, I talk to fishermen a lot because they they know a lot about more, more about the system than I do. And, and if I'm, they, they basically say, if I'm suggesting that the removal of fish is reducing nutrients to the environment uh, is bad, well, they, they, they say, well, the potential counterpoint is that where, where you have overfishing, you also have lots of humans. Where you have those humans, they could be dumping nutrients into the environment as well. So can these human nutrients supplant the nutrients lost by, by overfishing? And so initially, this was some a question that kind of uh, intimidated me because I didn't know the answer. But thinking a lot about it with Amy Roseman and Craig Lehman, we decided to kind of um, turn this around and challenge ourselves to ask the question. And so we came up with a hypothesis that the ratios between the sources are actually different. So human nutrients are typically higher in phosphorus um, relative to nitrogen, and, and the nutrients recycled by fish are typically higher in nitrogen relative to phosphorus. And so I, I proposed this for my NSF uh, dig and the EPA STAR. And um, now I have a full factorial design with 16 different reefs where I'm, I'm uh, simulating overfishing and uh, nutrient pollution using these little fertilizer feeders that I made. Um, and this is an ongoing study that can go on for roughly two years. And uh, the first full sampling event will be in June. And so I'm really excited to see what we find. So the idea is that the different ratios will affect the production around these reefs. And um, these reefs really do provide an awesome experimental unit. And the good thing is that once you put them in, you're not exactly going to take them out. So we can continue studying them over years. So now we have some evidence that 
consumers do affect primary production in these ecosystems. Can we scale this up to the ecosystem level? As I mentioned earlier, um, each species within these communities has a unique ratio of nutrients. And this can affect the storage, and then when you think about them feeding, uh, what they're feeding on as well, it can affect the supply of nutrients uh, to the ecosystem. So this sets up a real nice context for asking questions about the role of biodiversity for ecosystem function. So what I did was I modeled nitrogen and phosphorus supply, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon storage, and then this aggregate measure of multifunctionality across this really extensive data set of surveys that I got in collaboration with Peter Mumby out of James Cook University. And so he did uh, extensive surveys of fish communities across seven different islands, 172 communities, and thousands and thousands of fish. And what I really love about this data set is that they did it across different ecosystem types. So we have uh, mangrove and seagrass ecosystems plus four types of coral reef ecosystems. And so this spans a really large gradient of biodiversity. And ultimately, I was able to model uh, 144, or account for 144 species within this system, which accounts for 99.4% of the biomass across, this, uh, across all ecosystems. And just to give you an idea of how large the spatial gradient of this survey was, this is the whole Caribbean. And the survey took place in this region. So this is a large part, essentially the whole northern Antilles. And they focused on areas that were relatively healthy. So now we're looking, at, we're looking at the way just environmental gradients as opposed to human-induced gradients. Okay, so there are two main objectives of this study. First, to test the role of biodiversity for ecosystem function across gradients of species richness. And so this, this data set really did provide um, a, a novel look into biodiversity because we had so, so many species within these communities Plus, we had this really large gradient that we could study. And so that is something, the, the spatial scale aspect is something that's really been fundamentally lacking in some of the biodiversity ecosystem function literature. The second objective was to test the insurance hypothesis across this biodiversity gradient. So the insurance hypothesis predicts that ecosystem function will be um, robust to species loss due to large differences in, functional, in the functional role of species. This is something that's been tested in uh, theoretical and model communities, but not so much using real data from real communities. And so this, again, this data set provided a nice, uh, a nice context in which to ask some of these questions. All right, so I'm not going to go into the methods uh, at all, how I did this. What I'm going to try to do is just provide some of the, some of the results, and summarize those uh, for you all. So we have here on the y-axis ecosystem function. And when I say that, in this, for this study, I'm talking about the processes of supply and storage. The results um, were relatively consistent across these different processes. They did vary to some degree, but for this talk, I'm just going to kind of generalize. So with respect to spe species richness, we found a strong positive effect in species richness. This is consistent with previous studies, um, but it really struck me. First and foremost, it was far and away the strongest predictor in all the models. And, and I honestly didn't, didn't think that was going to be the case. Um, and so that's actually what got me looking into this further, because I, I did this initial model just trying to understand what community characteristics uh, were affecting these processes. And this far and away drove things. So I started asking more questions. Um, we found a negative effect of diversity. And so this suggests that species had disproportionate effects um, within these communities. So diversity you can think about as evenness here. This is a, it was a significant um, negative relationship, but it was relatively weak, and it was strongly driven by seagrass beds, which are, have the lowest number of species in them and are really driven by only a few species. So in that sense, there's strong uh, species uh, disproportionate effects. And then we found a positive relationship with functional group diversity. And so Functional group here, I'm referring to trophic positions, so herbivores, predators, omnivores, etc. And this was also really surprising to me. I thought that certain functional groups would really be driving some of these processes. So this, this suggests that functional groups don't have a disproportionate effect. Um, and I really thought the predators would have a disproportionate effect on recycling because they're really feeding on higher resource foods, and so they should be dumping out nutrients at different rates. Um, but that wasn't the case. Okay, so 
the second objective was to test essentially how robust these ecosystems are to species loss. To test this, I used simulation models for all processes and all ecosystem types. The idea here is that I constructed uh, simulation models with three different scenarios of species loss. First was completely random, so random removal of, of individuals. But then I wanted to provide a little bit of reality uh, into these simulation models, so I, I did random removal. And so the idea with just for the record, the idea with these simulation models is that we can remove species from the community and then measure how, with those species loss, how that community feeds back on these ecosystem processes. So the second um, scenario was to remove species but compensate for biomass. So when we pull species out, we would allow other species that are still in the community to increase in biomass. Um, so we're re retaining a relatively consistent biomass uh, across the community. And then the third scenario is compensation for biomass and trophic structure. And so this idea here is if we remove an herbivore, we let other herbivores within, we let other herbivores increase in biomass, so we're retaining a relative proportion of herbivores within the community. So say if herbivore is 20% of the biomass, then they stay 20% of the biomass. And so this is essentially increasing in, in like um, community composition is the way I would think about it. So the idea is that we can measure model variants um, which provides an inference about the stability at which the community can provide these ecosystem functions of recycling nutrients or storing nutrients. And the hypothesis would be that as you increase species richness, you would increase stability. And we, so we, we thought that you would see the weakest effect with this just random removal and the strongest effect where you're controlling for more community destruction. So what we found was strong general support for the insurance hypothesis. So that is that Ecosystem with more species were more robust to species loss. And we, well, with respect to um, how these different scenarios of species loss affected the strength of these relationships, we, as we predicted, the, the, the weakest was the random removal process, but actually the strongest was just retaining biomass. So this suggested that um, the trophic structure wasn't really increasing the, the stability in which these communities could feed back on these ecosystem processes. It also suggests that with respect to conservation, we can, if we can maintain a certain level of species richness and biomass within the community, then we can be retaining some of these, eco, uh, these ecological or ecosystem processes. Um, but I'm going to highlight, and I, again I didn't really talk about this, the strength of these relationships did vary among the different processes. But it wasn't super substantial. All right, so just to provide a little context of, of how much these fish are recycling nutrients into the environment, this is a, a figure. This is nitrogen um, uh, supply per area per day. And in the blue, we have the supply rates from a fish community in the Bahamas and a fish community in the Florida Keys. And in the gray, we have uh, nitrogen loading to the Florida Keys essentially accounting for everything but the fish community. So this is river runoff, um, uh, nutrients from the Florida Bay, upwelling, nitrogen fixation, all these different processes but not fish community. And then the, this last one here is loading of nitrogen to the Mississippi River Basin. So this is fertilizer, human sewage, etc. So I want to first say that I fully acknowledge that these aren't exactly like comparing apples to apples. The scales are fundamentally different. But the point here is that the, the amount of nutrients that these fish are recycling in these ecosystems is unprecedented. And it's completely overlooked in models of how these ecosystems are functioning. We recognize that nutrients are really important, particularly in these coral reef ecosystems, but we never talk about potentially the main source of nutrients for the coral. And so this just really highlights to me that it's something we really need to be considering uh, in the future. Okay, so um, another question that we often get is, okay, yeah, fish recycle nutrients, um, and that's important in these nutrient-limited ecosystems, but how much does that matter across environmental um, gradients of nutrient availability? And so this is the, um, the NSF grant that Craig and I wrote up. And we wanted to test this across gradients of nutrient availability. And so that's not only geophysical gradients, so that would be like upwellings. In, in the Bahamas, for example, very low nutrients because we don't have much rivers. We don't have any rivers. And there's very little oceanic upwelling. 
but in some other areas that have rivers and they have upwelling. Uh, but it's also across gradients of anthropogenic nutrients, so sewage inputs, etc. And then the other gradient is fish density, and this is essentially a gradient of overfishing. And the idea with this figure is that the bars coming out of the graph indicate the, the relative importance of fish nutrient supply for primary production. And so this in red would indicate or would be uh, representative of the Bahamas, where we have high fish density and low nutrient availability. The importance of fish recycling is extremely great. Whereas this here would maybe uh, uh, represent Haiti, where you have low fish density and high nutrient availability. And so the importance of fish recycling is not, uh, is not so great. So we are testing this using artificial reefs across three different regions in the Caribbean. First in the Bahamas, second on Hispaniola, so that's Dominican Republic and Haiti, and then finally in the Grenadines. This represents a gradient of nutrient availability. We have more ambient nutrients down here in the Grenadines, rivers, um, lots of oceanic upwelling. And then within each of these sites, we're going to span a gradient of human nutrients, so relatively healthy, pristine areas to heavily impacted, for example, like one of the sites would be in Nassau, in the Bahamas. Um, and this research is in close collaboration with the Nature Conservancy. And so all these sites are either going to be in marine protected areas or they're areas that are potentially proposed to be marine protected areas. So a lot of the data that we're collecting can directly be used by TNC to assess whether or not these could be uh, good areas for MPAs um, or potentially used in other conservation measures such as uh, regulating nutrient inputs to systems. Okay, so just summarizing uh, about the role of consumers in these nutrient dynamic um, pathways in these coastal ecosystems. I feel we, we've um, provided good support for the role of consumers in driving important nutrient pathways in these coastal ecosystems. Um, We've shown that aggregating fish can create biogeochemical hotspots, and this has really important implications for fisheries production and potentially for blue carbon. And that the conservation of biodiversity is really important to maintain some of these biogeochemical processes. Something that we need, we're beginning to work on and that needs to be uh, remembered is that the relative importance of this is highly contextual or uh, dependent on the uh, environmental context. And so again, this is something we're putting a lot of energy into trying to understand uh, in the future. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some of the proposed research for this fellowship. Individual specialization has gained a lot of attention in recent years, particularly in population, community, uh, and evolutionary ecology. Dan Bolnick here in this room uh, has been a real leader in this field. And he came up with this conceptual figure that basically um, proposed the idea if you have a population, so this in white is the population, that spans a large niche width, it doesn't necessarily mean that the individuals within that population also span this large niche width. They could occupy a smaller niche space within that and collectively create a population with this large, uh, they can span this niche width or axis of this. Um, Another thing that's been gaining a lot of attention is this idea that population level behavior can have really important feedbacks to ecosystem function. So Oswald Smith has done a really great job testing some of this stuff in the old fields of New England. So he's shown that the behavior of this top predator, the spider, can regulate the behavior of the grasshopper, which in turn could, could affect primary production uh, at the base of the food web. And so my proposed research is to sort of integrate these ideas and ask the questions about if individuals can have feedbacks for ecosystem function. So I first started thinking about this when I conducted uh, a snapper movement study in a mangrove estuary in the Bahamas. So we inserted this um, telemetry, this radio tag, into the bellies of these fish, and then we tracked them around this estuary using these um, acoustic receivers. And what we found was really strong individual specialization in movement patterns. So not only were fish um, moving differently, but they were moving consistently across these, these est this estuary. And some fish are having disproportionate movements. So some are moving further than others. But again, the, the key is that these patterns are really consistent. And so I actually did this before I started my PhD. And I've, and I've always thought it was really interesting, but it only recently hit me 
that in moving around, they're also distributing nutrients. So they could be fundamentally affecting the distribution of nutrients across this ecosystem. So I took that schematic by Bolnick and I amended it to have ecosystem function on the y-axis here and trait variation on the x. And so the trait variation is movement behavior, or you can think about it in the context of the study, uh, the distribution of nutrients. And the individuals in this situation, some of them have disproportionate effects on ecosystem function. So when we think about that in terms of some, some form of perturbation, so typically anthropogenic perturbations don't extirpate populations, but more so reduce the number of individuals in the population. Um, we can see that it would have, if you lose certain individuals, it will fundamentally affect how that population uh, feeds back on these ecosystem processes. So putting this uh, in the more of a landscape uh, scale to show you all a little bit better, if we think about a, a river network, I, I mentioned that I study in a, uh, I work in a freshwater lab, they hated this diagram of the river network, I thought it was totally fine. Um, so if you overlay the movement of individuals onto this river network, you can see that some individuals go to certain areas and others do not. So the green and the, and the orange have uh, extensive movement. If we lose those two individuals within the community, all of a sudden we don't have movement of nutrients by, these, by this population to entire reaches of this network. So this could be really important for conservation or really for ecosystem feedbacks. So, the, the two questions that I wanted to ask were first, what is the role of interpopulation behavior diversity in mediating biogeochemical processes, processes within aquatic environments? And so this is, really, this is really saying, do individuals matter for ecosystem function? And the second question is, can population density thresholds associated with individual variation in behavior be predicted? So can we actually predict the number of individuals we need to maintain within a population for them to feed back um, for them to feed back on ecosystem function as, a, as the uh, original population uh, did. And so to test this, I propose to use, uh, apply a portfolio theory, which is an economic theory, or created as an economic theory that's been widely used in biodiversity research. And it's, um, the idea is that a diverse portfolio is analogous to high biodiversity. And so it's, it's actually similar to the insurance hypothesis, but it's calculated very differently. But it, uh, in, the, in the context of this study, it would estimate how well the population can maintain ecosystem function given loss of individuals. I would apply this to two data sets. First, the data set of snapper movement and mangrove restoration. So there's roughly 90 individuals, one population. But the good thing about this data set is that we know we have individuals doing different things. And so it, it provides a nice framework to sort of establish the methods for how to do this. Then I'm proposing to scale this up to salmon movement in the Columbia River Basin. I have acquired this data through collaborations with uh, Nick Bowies at Utah State University. Uh, he is uh, part of a USGS co-op and been working with NOAA in, the, in uh, seven different drainages in seven meta populations for the past nine years. And he's tagged over 150,000 fish within these different drainages. And so, and there's two species of salmon, uh, the coho and the steelhead. And so we can test the movement, how the movement of these, these salmon are, are uh, how these salmon are moving across these different uh, river basins. Okay, so to test this, first you need, I would need to quantify the movement. I would use something like state-space models. Then I would overlay nutrients onto these movement patterns using bioenergetics models. Um, and then finally, Collectively, I can quantify the performance of the population. So that's again thinking about how um, robust this, this population is to loss of individuals with respect to ecosystem function. I would then use those data to parameterize simulation models. And so here we have the net distribution of nutrients on the y-axis and the population density or number of individuals in the population on the x. And I hypothesize that, that this um, these simulation models would create a positive saturated curve and we could actually predict the thresholds at which this um, at which further decreases in the number of individuals within a population would fundamentally affect the feedbacks on ecosystem function by these populations. 
And so the implications of this research are first it extends some of the concepts of individual specialization to include feedbacks on ecosystem function. Again, I said there's been a lot of great work in community and population evolutionary ecology, but it really hasn't been, to my knowledge, extended to, to this ecosystem uh, aspect. Second, it provides a novel conceptual approach to this biodiversity ecosystem function research. So instead of thinking about diversity of species, we're really thinking about diversity of individuals within a population. And then finally, I think it's got really important implications for conservation. So you can just think about a population that's being overfished. All of a sudden, we can set bounds on how many fish uh, you need to maintain within that population for that population to have appropriate feedbacks on ecosystem function. Okay, and so I just want to um, sort of end with this slide. I, um, throughout all of my work, I, I like to try to integrate um, education, outreach, and applied sciences. So I'm, I'm really interested in trying to get the word out about what I'm doing, but also help, um, help other students learn about science. So I've spent a lot of time mentoring young scientists. So I've had a lot of undergrads working with me in my lab and, and even in the field. Um, I've had some great experiences working with my advisor teaching some applied research classes at UGA. And I, I spend a lot of time or, uh, making guest presentations at local schools both in Georgia, but also, and actually more so, in the Bahamas. And it's really cool, especially down there, because these kids, they're not, they don't think about human impacts to marine environments that often. And you know, I come in and I talk about fish being, they giggle a lot, and think it's really weird. But they ultimately understand what I'm talking about. And it's, it's kind of, it's a really neat interaction. I've also been really fortunate to be, um, to be working closely with some, some nonprofits in the Bahamas particularly friends of the environment who have really allowed me to disseminate some of my research into the community. And then some of the future research and recent research with the Nature Conservancy uh, where we're actually trying to evaluate potential areas for marine protected areas. And so with that, I'd just like to thank my advisors, uh, Andrew Roseman and Craig Landon, who have been extremely critical for all this research and funding. So.